There was a book written by a fellow named uh, Dr. Les Parrott. And um, the book was called Shoulda, Woulda, Coulda. You ever heard that phrase before? I shoulda, I woulda, I coulda, but I didn't, right? Well, that's what his book's about. And, but inside that book, it tells of an old legend about three men. And uh, each man carried two sacks. I'm sure you saw the sermon title. Two sacks. One sack was tied in front of his neck. The other was resting on his back. When the first man was asked uh, what was in his sacks, he said, well, in the sack on my back are all the good things, all the good things friends and family have done for me, all the good things I've I've tried to do for others. And that way they're kind of hidden from view. Not always, you know, looking at what I've done, because I want to look forward to the good that I can do in the future. Okay, that was good. What about the back? And he said, um, in the, the front sack, or what about the, the sack in the front? And he said, well, in that sack is all the bad things that have happened to me, all the bad things that I've done and that others have done to me and things that have occurred. And every now and then I stop and I open that front sack and I, with all those bad things in there, and I take a look, see what I can learn from those and uh, examine them, I think about them, and because he stopped so much to concentrate on all the bad stuff in his life, his pace was slow, made little progress. When the second man was asked about his sacks, he said, well, um, something entirely opposite from the first guy. He said, in the front sack are all the good things that have happened to me and the good things I've tried to do. And uh, I like to see them, so quite often I take them out to show them off to people. And, uh, you know, to reminisce. Well, what about the sack in the back? And he answered, well, I keep all my mistakes, all my regrets, and um, I carry them about all the time. Sure, they're heavy, they slow me down, but, you know, for some reason... I just can't let him go. Have we met someone before in our lives that they carry around all their regrets, all the bad things, and it weighs them down? We've all met somebody like that or been someone like that. Well, we got to the third guy. And uh, he said, well, keep all the good things in, in the front sack, and I put all the bad things in the back sack, but I'm going to let you in on a little secret. What's that? He said, I cut a hole in the bottom, and they go right through. No weight at all. I can travel about in life without my regrets, without all the bad things I've done, because they're behind me, and they're not weighing me down. That might be a good story for the beginning of a new year, amen? We all carry around hurts and regrets, things that weigh us down. And the new year would be a great time to just cut a hole in the bottom of that sack. Let them go. Let them be behind you. Leave them on the road behind you. And focus on the good things that have happened in our lives and the good things that we can do. Allow that to propel us forward. You know, it's interesting that we're uh, starting this uh, first Sunday in the new year on what day? Does anyone know? The day of Epiphany. Epiphany. Hmm. Good word. Uh, It's the... beginning of the season, actually, of of Epiphany, which begins with the wise men traveling and following a distant star until they came to the place where it seemed to be over top, and there they found the uh, Christ, the King of kings and Lord, Lord of lords, a young child by that time. 
A lot of people think that it, you know, it happened like two or three days while later while they were um, you know, hanging out there in Bethlehem that it was probably closer to about a year to a year and a half, which is, if you remember the story, why Herod had all the kids two and under put to death. He was trying to kill Jesus. Remember, Joseph had a dream, get yourself to Egypt, get your family out of there, and they hightailed it to Egypt, and that's why um, Jesus was saved. So Epiphany is, a, is an awesome time of year, and it goes clear through, the season goes clear through until we get to the transfiguration of Christ, which is a great word, but it means we see him in all of his glory. And uh, so it's not only a, a season of the church year, though. A lot of people, uh, it's, it's kind of crept into the secular vernacular. You know, um, when we say that someone has had an epiphany, it's like they've had a sudden revelation. It doesn't necessarily have to be a theophany where they encounter God, but rather it's just a sudden res revelation. Have you ever had a moment where all of a sudden it all made sense? Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes to our chagrin, amen? Yeah. And other times to our delight. But when we say that someone's had an epiphany, we usually mean that person has had a moment where they have achieved a sudden realization, a revelation, an awareness, or a knowledge of something after which all the other events are, are, are thrown into a new light. And... Uh, Therefore, as such, epiphanies can be life-changing. How many of us have had an epiphany before where it kind of changed our lives in the direction we were going? The moment you met Jesus might have been an epiphany, amen? Yep. Now, if you were raised in the church and you stayed with the church and, and you just kind of were always a Christian, you surely had other epiphanies, t times when Christ became very real or when life just became very real. I'm going to give you an example of an epiphany for me. Some of you have heard my testimony before. Some of you have not. So I'm just going to share a portion of it. But back in 1991, I got a phone call from a guy named Pastor John. I had been attending his church because there was this good-looking girl that was sitting on the organ bench playing the organ. And um, I decided I would become her chauffeur, take her to church and, and hang out with her there. Um, I can assure you that I was not a Christian at that time. I knew about the Christ. I was loaded full of Scripture, but I wasn't walking in obedience, and that's for sure. And I'm being nice to myself. Anyhow, um, things have been going along just fine. I get this call from Pastor John. He goes, any chance you got time for me to maybe just take a walk? And sure. So I drove out to the church, which is right outside of Alliance, Ohio. And he said, let's, let's take a walk. And we went out of the church and down um, this dirt road, Salem Church Road. And um, corn on the left, cows on the right. It was uh, just a good old country road outside of Alliance. And the niceties were, you know, that you do at the beginning of any conversation, they were over with pretty quickly. And then... He said something that I'll never forget. Scott, it's time for you to leave the church or become a Christian. What will it be? Now, I want you all to know, I've been encouraging you now for, t we're in our 10th year of me encouraging you to go out and give him heaven. Amen? That means go out because we love the Lord, love one another, and we... We make disciples, so we got to get out there and make disciples. I just want you to know, this is not a good evangelism technique unless the Holy Spirit is guiding you to do it. You don't walk up to somebody who's come to church once and say, hey, get out of the church and be a Christian. 
That's just not the way it works. But you know what? It's exactly what I needed to hear. And he had somehow sensed that from the Holy Spirit. And uh, he kept talking. At first, I was, I'm, I know the veins in my neck had to be bulging. I was, I was a bit angry. And I was pretty fit back then, able to handle myself. And I thought, this tall, thin Oxford theologian, yeah, I snap him like a number two pencil. That, I mean, that's what crossed my mind. And yet my ears continued to hear what he had come to say or what he'd, he had asked me to take this walk to say. And you know what? He loved me enough that he was going to say what needed to be said and take the consequences, whatever they were. And I realized that. And I finally said to him, John, I'll tell you what, I've given my life to Jesus Christ so many times I've lost count. It's just never taken. It's never stuck. And he goes, is there a chance that you have been asking him to be your savior without accepting him as your Lord? I'm going to say that again because it's, this is where the epiphany came. He says, are you asking him to be your Savior but not your Lord? Because, you know, you don't get one without the other. I was like, hmm. I was quiet. I just listened. And it was time for him to teach, and he, he did it so well. He, he asked me if I remembered the medieval ages and uh, the dark ages, medieval times, I said, of course, and, you know, I knew my history. And he said, well, there was the lord of the manor or the lord of the castle, and then there were all the serfs, if you will, people who would come, and the lord would give them land to farm so they could support their family. And if uh, there was a bad guy coming into town, um, they could all run inside the walls and be safe with the lord and, uh, because he'd take care of them. And when the crops failed, the Lord would have a, a surplus, and he'd make sure they didn't starve. The Lord took care of his people, but the Lord of the manor had complete say. If, if he said, uh, strike his head, your head was missing. That's how it worked back then. The Lord had total control. He goes, so that's what I mean when I'm saying Lord. I went, oh. He goes, you know an awful lot of Scripture. How much are you living the Scripture that you know? He goes, continue to learn about Christ. Continue to grow. And I'm here to tell you that relationship will bloom. And you know what? All of a sudden, it was like everything made sense. Oh, that's why I've given my life to Christ and it's never made, it didn't mean a hill of beans because there was no life change there because I was not bowing to him as Lord. I was just saying, thank you for saving me. Whew. You know, and then going out and basically living for hell the other six days of the week. And so um, that was my epiphany. And it changed me so dramatically that years later, um, about seven years later, I ended up going into ministry to be a pastor. And I want you to know, this is one guy that never liked pastors. I didn't realize that I loved Pastor John until after I became a Christian. I'll be honest with you. I just, that's the way I was built. Those are back in the days uh, when... Tammy, Faye, and Baker. You remember who, Jim, James, Jim Baker and Tammy? That was back in the day when they were going through their rough time, where um, they were. Uh, Jim went off to jail, and it was just it was it was horrible for the faith. It was a black eye on Christendom, and that just gave me another reason not to like pastors. And then I found myself becoming one, and I was like, I wonder how many people are sitting out there that really just can't stand pastors. You know, they're either here for the food or for the fellowship. I mean, when I started going to church back then, it was because there was a good-looking girl on the organ bench. So epiphanies are important. 
Epiphanies are times when God can change you, when he can enter in, if you will. That's what Scripture says. Whomsoever will, I'll come into their lives and take up residence there. And our body then becomes a, a temple of the Lord. Maybe um, today you're sitting there and you're thinking, you know, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. Because I'll be honest with you, that's where I'm at. Um, I told my kids when I was talking to them on the phone, I told my wife, New Year, I'm not going to be sick anymore. And so I'm here to tell you today, I am healed. I just don't know when. But I am healed. And I'm not going to be sick anymore. I'm tired of it. And I want you to know, if you're in need of an epiphany in your own life, this is a great place to come. Can I get an amen? <laughs> okay. This is a great place to come. Amen? There it is. All right. Um, you know... It, when we turn our life over to God, when we ask his guidance and, and his persistence to be at work within us, that's what it's about. It, it, it kind of gives us a new start. It's the beginning of a new year. I say it's a good time for a, good, a, a new start. You know, um, the symbol of light in, in the darkness of this world. And if anybody, if you're reading the newspaper, if you're watching the, the TV, you know that right now is a pretty dark time in the uh, history of humanity. Amen? Yeah, regrettably. And in this darkest season of our lives, the symbol of light comes out as the, one of the favorite symbols in Scripture when it describes Christ. When it describes us for he not only came in to be the light of the world but then he turns to us and he says now go therefore and give him heaven you know be a light in the darkness you know um what's the song say about we don't light a candle and then put it under a bushel no i'm gonna let it shine right you remember all the handwork and stuff liturgical <laughs> dance they call it yeah. Christ said about our witness that, that we're not to put it under a bushel, but rather that we're to shine it as if we were a city on a hill, shining as a beacon. Christ himself was the light of the world, if we read through the Gospel of John, which we're starting next week. We're going to be preaching out of the Gospel of John. It's going to go with our small group, um, uh, small groups that are meeting, and um, if you're not part of a home group yet, you don't want to miss this one because the preaching is going to be uh, around what we're learning in small groups. So I invite you, uh, it's not too late to join. You just need to see Jeff Lewis or any one of the pastors, okay? When Israel, or I'm um, with Israel, when Isaiah sought to um, proclaim the coming of the anointed one, what did he say? He said, Arise, shine, for thy light has come. Hmm, there it is. Christ is our light, and in him, Scripture says, is no darkness at all. None. And that's great news as we begin this new year. Uh, our light has come. Christ is our light, and in him, no darkness at all. And just as light is the appropriate symbol for Christ, darkness is the appropriate symbol for a world without Christ. Have you ever wondered what people will say and what people centuries from now will think about our culture? There is a book written called A Fistful of Fig Newtons. The title caught my eye. So it was one of those freebies on um, the Kindle thing. And uh, I don't know what they call that. But I went to it and just was reading a little bit of it to see what it was about. And uh, Gene Shepard, the author, depicts this group of archaeologists in the future, distant future. 
excavating the remains of New York City. Hmm. And um, they were burrowing under what is today called Madison Avenue, which if you know New York, it's the heart of the world of modern advertising. That's, that's where it happens, right there. Just like you got Wall Street with all the stocks and, you know, all that stuff. Madison Avenue, that's where you get into all the different firms that do uh, advertising. And they discovered these tin canisters holding reels of videotape, hours of television commercials. That's what they were. And uh, they finally figured out how to play these. Because, um, I don't know, how many of you could still set up a reel-to-reel -reel and get it going? You know? That's pretty distant past. Huh? So, um, found, finally found a way to view the tapes, and they grew quite excited. They got anticipation going on to see what is on these, because they think that um, they're going to discover something about our era and our time and what we were like and what was important to us. And one of the videotapes contained this scene in which three women move to the foreground and they pick up some mysterious white circular rolls. And they begin to handle the rolls and squeeze the rolls. And their eyes kind of glazing in ecstasy as they handled those rolls. You know where I'm going, don't you? A stern male figure arrives clad in a white uniform, and he's, he looks like somebody who's in charge, who has some authority. Ladies, he says, please don't, don't squeeze the Charmin. The three women continue to squeeze the rolls. Mr. Whipple takes one of the rolls from one of the ladies, and then he begins squeezing it. Do you remember this? Like, I was going to show it, but... I didn't know whether toilet paper on the screen on a Sunday would be appropriate. But I thought I could at least talk about it. And um, the one woman squeals, I just can't help it, Mr. Whipple. And uh, amazed at the apparent significance of this archaeological find, the leader of the excavation says this, if we can find out what was on those shamans, or what they were used for, I believe we would know what their civilization was all about and what they believed in, end quote. Now, sounds like most of us, if not all of us, remember the shaman commercials. But wouldn't you say that we hope sincerely that our culture is more than bathroom tissue. And yet there are times when we examine the spiritual landscape of our country and we wonder. <laughs> life is so confusing and I just wish that life was as easily explained as that great philosopher of the comic strips, Charlie Brown, once decided it was. Lucy saying to him, life is a mystery, Charlie Brown. Do you know the answer? And this is what Charlie Brown answers. He says, be kind, don't smoke, be prompt, smile a lot, eat sensibly, avoid cavities and mark your ballot carefully. Avoid too much sun, send overseas packages early, love all creatures above and below, ensure your belongings and try to keep the ball low. And before you can say another word, Lucy interrupts, hold real still. Because I'm about to hit you a very sharp blow upon the nose. <laughs> we can appreciate that frustration, can't we? I mean, none of us appreciate to know it all full of platitudes, when we're living life in such a dark time? Do we see the importance and the urgency of being light to our culture, to our beautiful town? 
It's a great place to live. And yet, it is dark. It's dark. We're still hovering right about 90% of the folks in our town. The folks that are good people, but they don't yet confess Christ. You know, maybe this past year has been a little rough for you. I know it has been for me. And I know it has been for Pastor Jan. I hope you remember to pray for her daily. It's, it's been a heavy load for her. You know, and um, perhaps you just need someone to put, your, put their hand on your shoulder and encourage you. Um, how many of you are aware that Scripture tells us that the people of Jesus' day, okay, we're only a few years out from the cross, Okay, somewhere around 20 years. And the writer of Hebrews is telling them, please do not forsake assembling as is the habit of some. For we must assemble as we need encouragement. The encouragement we find one for the other. I mean, don't you feel encouraged when you come on a Sunday and you you see the place full? And, and, and you get a chance to talk to people out there with your mouth full and everything, and it's a great time. But I'll tell you what, um, even in Jesus' day, shortly after his death, people were like, you know, not showing up for worship. And you know what? They were then living in a dark culture, and their light was growing dimmer by the moment because they had no encouragement. Arise, shine, your light has come. That's what Scripture says. And you know what? We need to be saying the same thing to a dark culture, to a beautiful town that's in a dark spot spiritually. What would it take to help you get your your new year off to a good start, I wonder? I asked this in the last, I'll, I'll give you the results of the last worship after I get the results from here, but how many of you have made a resolution for this year? Keep them up, keep them up. Okay, I count three. Now, you get three more than nine o'clock. Seriously, it's, I guess it's not, um, I don't know. It's not the cultural norm anymore, anymore because I used to ask that question early in my ministry and most hands would go up. Here's what's going on. When we're not encouraged and our light's not shining brightly, we get a little bit dimmer at a time. And um, our culture is changing. Unable to see the way without the church leading the way, many just continue to encounter the dark. I'm not saying make resolutions. I'm saying it's just one other thing where people become less motivated to do new things, to find Christ and experiencing him in new ways. I hope every guy in here will be at the men's prayer breakfast next Saturday. It's going to be a great time. Jeff's going to talk to us about experiencing God. And um, I look forward to that. I hope you are too. Uh, Nine o'clock? Yes, nine o'clock. And I hear that uh, the gravy and biscuits are going to be great. So I'm looking forward to that. But as we uh, come to this new year, we realize there's something within our heart that hears arise shine, your light has come, and we realize that we've got to go out and say the same thing to other folks and tell them about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I hope it creates a sense of urgency within you because today we are one day closer to the day that Christ returns. Amen? We've never been closer to the day of his return than today. If you look in the dictionary, the First definition for light, according to Merriam-Webster, is something that makes vision possible. 
without a vision, the people perish. That's scripture. And if you can't see where you're going because of the light or the lack of it, I'm just saying. Should we find ourselves in the presence of Christ, I think we'd find ourselves overwhelmed and yet in a great way, in a wonderful way. Overwhelmed with the light of his love. Um, I think Bart Millard and uh, Mercy Me put out a song a number of years ago. I just want to read part of the lyrics to I Can Only Imagine. Have you heard that song before, I Can Only Imagine? Yeah. It says, surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus, or in awe of you, be still? Will I stand in your presence or on my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? I can only imagine. That'll be a, a true epiphany. We know that we have that final grand epiphany of the glory of Christ that will last for an eternity. So, my friends, my brothers and sisters in Christ, are we tired of living in semi-darkness? Arise. Arise, shine, your light has come. Amen? Amen.